All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Thanks for your patience. So first off, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Straddling, for their sponsorship of the Lunch and Learn series and for their overall support of UCI Applied Innovation. Today's Lunch and Learn speaker is Jack Beiser. Jack is the founder and CEO of Secure.me, a cybersecurity company that eliminates passwords securely. A 35 plus year software industry veteran, Jack is an expert on outsourcing, software development, mobile and web applications, authentication, and mobile payments. He is here today to present the top 10 tips for successful software development. Welcome, Jack. Thank you, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right, good. So uh, I'd like to make this an interactive session, okay? Um, uh, and, uh, and please, if you have questions, take your hand up, challenge me, I'm okay. I've been doing this for over 35 years. I've learned one or two tricks. And the, my purpose today is to share with you the software development uh, process, procedures and methodologies that we use uh, in our company, okay? So uh, Haley did a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Haley, by the way. And thank you for organizing this. Isn't this nice, guys, to be able to come and talk and share, you know? So we, we're in Orange County. Uh, and so as an in the entrepreneurship community, if we don't help each other, who's going to help us, right? So, uh, so my, my, my intentions are, are good today. <laughs> and if I don't answer a question, please come and see me afterwards. I'll be here uh, until all the questions are answered, okay? So what uh, Haley didn't mention uh, was I actually am dumb enough to run two companies, not one. Uh, Secure Me is our cybersecurity company, and Septium is our custom software development company. Okay, so Septium is in our—I can't remember—is the fifteenth or sixteenth year now in the business, and I've been a CTO for a good number of years before then as well. And uh, as I said, I started over thirty-five years ago uh, as a software developer, went up the ranks, became a CTO, and uh, and uh, I, sh I do the short stick, and eventually became the CEO. Uh, how many people know about Peter Principle in life? Yes. Can you tell me what it is? Uh, so why is your level of incompetence? Right. So you go up in life, and then you reach your level of incompetence, and, and then you either try to figure out there or you step back down. So uh, I've reached the CEO level. That's my level of incompetence. Okay. But I was a damn good CTO. So on the software side of things, uh, I can very comfortably talk. Uh, so uh, let's get started. Uh, some of you uh, may not know about me, but you've probably uh, heard about me or heard about things that I've done. I like to tinker. Just a quick show of hands. How many people uninstalled software on their PCs? Great. We have a good number of them. How many people uninstalled an app by deleting it on their phones? Okay. Uh, some people are not raising their hands. Uh, that's okay. Participation is optional. But I know you have a phone, and I know you've uninstalled, you've deleted an app on your phone. <laughs> so that's uh, that's a truthful thing. Okay. How many people uh, update their computers with new software? Windows, Mac, Office 365. Okay, a good number of them. And okay, this is the real cruncher for me. This information. Uh, how many of you have used like a push uh, verification, push notification verification on your phone for like two-factor authentication? You try to log into a website, and you got a notification. You said yes. Okay, there are a good number of them. All of them are my inventions. Okay, so uh, uh, and uh, and and the, the first two were many many years ago, and and the last one is fairly recent. I actually hold a patent on that. Uh, but these are fun stuff to do. So we like to tinker a lot. We like to push things to the edge when we see there's a good use case for it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we're tenacious. We don't give up. That's the only way you innovate. You have an idea. You work on it. You see some stuff. You work on it. You work on it. You work on it. You work on it. And eventually, that's, that's the invention. Okay? I've never had an idea that came to me uh, either in bed or when I'm taking a shower, or those are my inspiration points, and, and say it was just fully baked. 
for good innovation, you always have to like go through this tenacious cycle of improvement, 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 and <clears throat> now it works. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, one of the things that <clears throat> I was introduced as the CEO of SecureMe, I'm also the inventor and the and the software architect. Uh, so basically, we eliminate passwords. 81% of the data breaches are from uh, stolen uh, uh, passwords. So if you don't have a password, it can't be stolen. And you eliminate 81% of the data breaches. So, uh, and today we're going to discuss my top 10 tips that we still use internally. I've been using these methodologies and refining them for close to 20 years, okay? And this stuff works because I've delivered uh, over 100 projects successfully using these methodologies. So I'm going to be talking to you. I'm going to be telling you what I think is, is, you know, part of the tip is as a practitioner, software development practitioner. And then I'm going to switch hats, and I'll be the entrepreneur and say, okay, now that we're doing it in our company as an entrepreneur with limited resources and, and time and money, how do we apply it? So you get to see both sides. So I'm not just here as a teacher, I'm also here as a student to share my experiences on how these things work in real life. Okay, any questions on that? All right. So uh, let, let me just very quickly show you what the product is so you get a feel for it. It's like a 10 second demo. Can we switch over please? So we're going to see a browser demo. I want to log in to my G Suite account. So what happens is, can you click on the red button, please? Yeah, so we get a QR code. Can you move the cursor, please? Uh, so let's see if I can scan from here. Ah, my phone is not big enough. So I'm going to swim. My phone got authenticated. No user IDs, no passwords. And voila, I just logged in. OK? So that's. Our whole journey is building that product. Okay, it looks very simple, but uh, the simpler it is, the harder it is to build. Thank you. Can you just log out? And this is actually an email address I use. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then switch back to presentation, please. Darn, I got to get a phone that could scan from there. Because uh, I usually do the demos like halfway across the room. It's pretty impressive. Uh, next slide. Oh, I have the slides. So uh, what's success? We're talking about successful software development. It, it, we all have an idea as to what success is. But at least for the purposes of this conversation, I'd like to frame it so we're all thinking of the same thing. Okay? Definition of success is on time, on budget, with the required features, okay? For software development, that's the, I think, the most complete definition of what success is, okay? Because we all know about time slips. We all know about uh, budget uh, not being met, requiring additional funding. We all know either a feature set that's growing or a feature set that's shrinking to be able to meet the time frames. So those are all factors. Actually, uh, those are really the, 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 the three knobs that we have in software development, okay? So you can control any project if you have the control over those three knobs. Uh, if you don't have control over one, you can fairly easily control the project with the two knobs. And with one knob, it's very difficult. And if you don't have control of all of those three, I suggest you look for a new job, okay, or a new project. Okay, so let's look at some stats. They surveyed 50,000 projects around the world, and they found out 71% of the software projects actually fail. Does that resonate with anybody in the software side of things? Okay, one person did, thank you, too. I appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, by the way, how many of you are either building or managing software? Okay. Uh, how many of you are not really involved in software development? 
Okay. And how many of you are here for the free food or for free drinks? Or you had nothing better to do? You wanted to stay out of the sun? Okay. So uh, I just want to make sure that I tailor what I'm saying accordingly. So that's, that's only 29% of the projects are successful. Now, that's dismal. Are, are there any investors here? Okay, good. And if I told you, look, you put your money in here and uh, you only have 29% chance of success, 71% you're going to fail, okay, and it doesn't get any better, would you invest in it? No, at least I want 50-50, right? Uh, you know, lottery ticket buyers excluded, of course. But, uh, but you know, 29% is a very dismal thing. And assuming there are also competent people in software development, not everybody is incompetent, right? So even, even the good guys are having trouble. So what is that? Let's, let's look at the break, breakdown. Only 29% is successful. 18% are complete failures, projects scrapped. And 53% are over budget, almost twice the budget. Okay? That's significant. That's not 5 or 10%. Okay, 180% over budget is huge. So, but that's where we live, and that's more than half the projects. So what I'd like to do is, you know, do a little better than that. So I'm going to talk about our top, top 10 tips. And internally in Septium, we were able to get our success rates, which we track, from 29% to 88%. So we've actually tripled our chances of delivering successful projects using these 10 tips that I'm going to share with you that we use internally. I've been using them for a long time. Okay? And as I said, I've delivered over 100 projects uh, uh, on time, on budget with those. So the biggest reason for project failures is we, don't, we can't deal with changes or unknowns effectively. Okay, so what you don't know that you don't know will come back to hurt you. Okay, because if we knew everything, then it'd be easy. Because there are a lot of smart people in this room, and you would have all managed your projects just fine without any uh, any extra time or money uh, uh, allocated to it. So how do we do that? Well, uh, let's talk about the cost of a change, whether it comes as a request down the line or if it's a new feature or something that you discovered you didn't realize at the beginning. Those are all changes. So how we handle change is critical in successful project management. So there are three phases of each software version. Okay? Whether it's the first version or the tenth version, uh, you have a design process, and then you have an implementation process, which is the coding part, and then you have production, where the system is out and being used by customers. And then, you know, round again, you go through the next iteration. So far, so good. Any questions? I'm going a little fast, but there's going to be a good time for Q&A. Yeah. Yes? What you're saying is that uh, if there's a production uh, change, it's, it's 100 times uh, design. Well, you're a little ahead of me. Well, yes? Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? Oh, well, actually, he, he asked a question I'm going to answer right now. <laughs> so let's look at the cost of a change in each phase, right? That was your, kind of your question, OK? So if you are, let's say we want to go from red to blue as our color uh, palette, right? So we all thought there would be red. Red was good. Then we heard things about happening in the world. And we said, ah, I think we're going to go to blue because people respond to blue a little better. It's, it's a calmer color. It happens. So if we're in a design phase, our design is typically in a Word document. So we do search, replace, every occurrence of red with blue. And somebody does you know, a read on it to make sure that uh, you were not talking about accounting terms. <laughs> OK. Uh, and and you know, we're done. Right? It's a fairly simple thing to do. So let's allocate a unit cost of $1 for a change in the design state. Okay? It's easy. Now, in the implementation phase where people are coding, 
Well, we've got red buttons all over the place, okay? So we now have to scrap all those red buttons, and then we've got to build blue buttons. You got the OKs, you got the cancels with different hues and tones, and, and uh, a bunch of other stuff, okay? So that's going to take, obviously, a little more work. Okay, so let's allocate a unit cost of $10. So it's 10x the work. And typically, those are the, the, the factors are not too far from reality. Now, if we're in production, well, there could be a lot of content, a lot of uh, other stuff that may be red-based and, and has to be changed, databases, uh, data fields, uh, customer data, while you're running, because you can't really bring the system down and say, hey, we're going to take the next two weeks off. You're not going to be able to use the system. Well, when it comes back, it's going to be all blue, wonderful, okay? So just take a two-week vacation. You can't do that, right? So th that gets uh, significantly hairy for people who have handled production systems. So let's allocate a unit cost of 100 to it. And that's typically not too far in reality. So it change costs a dollar in design phase. A change costs $10 during coding, and a change costs $100 after you go to production, when people are using it. So my question to you is, if you wanted to make a change, where is the best time? What's the best phase to make that change in? What costs you the least? What's the best ROI? Anybody can answer that? Yes? Design? Design? Anybody think implementation? How about production? Good, you guys are smart. So, uh, if you're going to make some changes, think it through. Make it as early as you can. The longer you leave it, the more expensive it becomes. And that's a critical, a critical part of, of my uh, software development methodology. Good thinking. And that's why I think a lot of Subject content experts, uh, seasoned uh, software designers and architects. Uh, we have a, a process called uh, design intake process where we actually get together. All we do all day long, sometimes a couple of days, sometimes as much as two weeks, all we do is just go through this stuff to make sure we all understand it. Do we have any Star Trek fans in the room? Okay, I might be aging myself. Uh, there's an episode where Spock... Uh, puts uh, three fingers on Uhura's head, and he says, I'm going to do Vulcan mind meld, and their minds become one. So this is our Vulcan mild, uh, uh, mind meld process. Everybody has to understand what the business is about, what are you trying to solve, how are you going to solve it, what's some of the best ways, and where are the risks there always are. There are always things that you may not know, especially if you're doing it for the first time. There are always things that you don't know. Identify them, okay? And then uh, the more you know, the more likely the project is going to be successful, okay? So after the, our Vulcan mind meld process, our design intake process, we actually sit down and write some specifications, okay? I'm not here to promote Waterfall versus Agile or, or some of the other. Actually, our methodology is not neither one. Uh, pure water, Waterfall is not very good. It's not very effective. Pure Agile is not very effective. So this, we use a mixture of two. We try to get the best parts. So first, we've got to understand what the needs are, what they're trying to solve. Because uh, uh, I tell you, in, in many of the projects that I've designed, it's one thing to hear people say, well, I want this. And you think about it, but you're trying to solve that. Don't you think that, you know, this is better? So a lot of those conversations come up. Uh, the more you see, you know, the more you can evaluate. And the whole point is, you know, how do, how do we make ourselves successful? As entrepreneurs, we want to be successful, right? And there are things that we think that we know best, but it's really cool when somebody uh, comes in and is very helpful in telling you, okay, let's just check your assumptions and let's see if that's really the best way to go, okay? And then once we understand what we're doing, we document our ideas. Why do we document our ideas? Because the details is where the devil lives 
And when you're having your programmers trying to develop the software, they can't read your mind. Okay? Even though we talk to them every day, every night, they, they just can't read our minds. With all that detail and stuff, there's still some issues. So just as clear as you could be. Now, one of the things that we discovered is it's not just good enough to write down your thoughts, uh, your, what you discovered and what you think that you, know, you should do, but we also marry it with a UI, the crummiest looking UI you've ever seen, you know, stuff you draw on the back of an envelope type thing. But guess what? All the fields are there, all the buttons are there, all the workflow is there, you look through the stuff, say, oh, I see how this is gonna work. Why? Because when you marry the user interface, uh, again, this is a very rudimentary user interface, with the workflow and the business rules, you'll flush out issues in the design, okay? Uh, simple thing, just come back for you one second. Uh, for example, you may find that you may need, uh, let's say, product ID or something like that, okay? Well, if you never ask for it on an earlier screen, you can't display it you know, five screens later, right? Five pages later. So stuff like this. Yes, you had a question? Yeah, uh, what do you mean when you say ignore the business rules? Business rules? Yes. Uh, typical business rule. Um, user must be authenticated to use this, to, to use this module. Uh, or user has to be administrative. Only administrators will have access to this rule. Your balance can never be less than zero. Those are all the business rules. Okay, so you can extend it to, to whatever application you're developing. Because those business rules will actually guide the design. Okay? So now, I'll switch hats, virtual hats, and from uh, a uh, practitioner, I'm gonna go to an entrepreneur. Right? On, on the security side, how, what, what did we do? Yes, we actually had two uh, versions of the software built, and absolutely we did that. And it's not enough just to write it, as things change, you have to keep it updated, okay? Five years later, the stuff is still getting updated, okay? So, uh, and we would have absolutely failed, because it's a fairly complex design, we would have absolutely failed if we had not documented and had this thing done, okay? Very important. So, number two. Um, we break the projects into modules of one week or shorter. You can take any module that you want, even something that lasts three months or four months, but start breaking it into smaller pieces. Why do we break it into smaller pieces? Because the bigger the module, the more unknowns and unforeseens will be in there. If you break it down, to matter, a matter of days, each little thing to a matter of days, you'll have a much clearer understanding of it, okay? And the other part is, you can estimate, yeah, I think that's gonna take three months to do. Well, how did you estimate it? Three months, okay? You won't believe how often that's used, okay? Right thumbs, very important. Uh, but many times, if you have a project, if you have a module that's only three days, you think it's going to take three days, it's going to take three days. If you're wrong, three and a half days, four days, it's not going to take three weeks, right? So if you break it down, you also significantly increase your chances of estimating it correctly, okay? So, uh, and the other thing is, on the, imp uh, on the, on the entrepreneurship project management side, uh, or a project ownership side, if you know, like this is supposed to take two days, this is supposed to take three days, this is four days, you can track things. Are we hitting the milestones? Are we, are we getting there or are we having issues? Were we right in our estimates or are we off? Okay? And if you're off, typically you're not off that much. Some estimates we were off, but we very quickly identified them and, uh, and worked through them but at least you know early on. Uh, in the very old days of software development, there was a glass tower between the management and the technology folks. So the management and the business threw some requirements, 
and they didn't even talk to each other because, you know, good programmers were, had long hair and smoked things they were not supposed to and, and were hard to talk to, right? Uh, so, but, but they were good in the business and, you know, tolerated them because they were in business because of them. Uh, and the developers came back to say, six months. So about five and a half months later, there'd be this call saying, are we, are we okay? Are we doing on time? Yeah. Another week? Well, we kind of ran into an issue. I think we'll be a month off. Comes uh, uh, six months. Uh, it, well, the testing results showed us there were many parts that were not working and that we don't have the right equipment, so we really need to order uh, you know, this big new modern giant thing. Uh, we need another $250,000 for the equipment. And by the way, it's also going to add an extra three months of development time. Okay? This is how it was done. You can't do it this way. As a startup, as an early stage company, you just don't have the money to throw at these things anymore. Okay? And we're not getting funding before we build the products anymore. So it's, it's your pocketbook. So the more you understand it, the finer the estimates are, the shorter the time frames are, the more likely you're, you will be successful. So this sounds like, oh, okay, it's a small thing. It really is important. Any questions on it so far? Good. Uh, so uh, this is another key point of my uh, project management strategy. Uh, we are always managed based on the risk factors, okay? Uh, I know it makes a whole lot of sense, but you know that there are some things when you're designing you just don't understand so well, or you don't know well, or it's dependent on you being able to interface with another uh, product or an API or whatever it might be. You guess how it's going to be, but you don't know. So we always implement the risky modules early. Even if you have to like do a little throwaway project, do it at first, understand it before you commit to it. Okay, that might be a little R and D. Uh, we have had a few of those challenges, and uh, we did do a few throwaway projects uh, that didn't last too long. Uh, you know, we were not looking for a good workflow user experience, just understanding how something worked, whether it was working the way we expected to or not. Uh, and we did do some little course correction based on what we found, and it lowers, uh, lowered our risk factor, okay? It was a very essential part of it. Okay, so if we have short tasks, then we should have short milestones, okay? Typically, two to four weeks. That's enough time for you to build something of substance, but short enough so you don't endanger the project. Okay? And what you're looking is validation points. So uh, in, in our practice as, uh, as custom software development vendors, it's really important for us to be able to show transparency and progress. So these are also great in terms of saying, hey, these are the milestones. These are the three or five or ten things that we're going to be delivered on that date. And that date comes. A, is there a release? Yes, no. And if there is a release, then you check those things that are on the milestone list. Are they working? Are they not working? Okay? So everybody is clear. So if you get to have these every two to four weeks, then you know where your project is. You're never surprised. Okay? So, and there's one other huge advantage of doing that. Uh, we also got some working prototypes. Okay? And as you start using it, you get a feel for it. You can't think the feel. You feel the feel, right? So when we use that, we realize, yeah, I, we, I, you know, I thought it was going to work well. It does work, but it just feels clunky. This is not really the experience we wanted. So uh, thinking versus experiencing actually may lead to different results you realize, maybe I'll do it that way now that I've actually felt how it was doing. And that's important for a good product because a good product has to flow. Okay, you noticed I took my phone, put my fingerprint on it, said it's me, not, not somebody else who found my phone. Quick scan QR code, boom, you're in. 
you cannot, I don't think you can make that much uh, 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 faster or, or with fewer steps than that for a QR login, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, when we were building it, uh, I had this thing, look guys, hypothetical conversation, but it's real. Uh, let's say we don't have as much money. Each button, each step that we have uh, on our app cost me a million dollars. I need to save some money. What are we going to do? Okay? It's a fairly simple app. I mean, there's not a whole lot of things you can do with it. Uh, we decided that we did not need the enter button. Before, we used to enter the pin. We decided we did not need the enter button. We actually removed the enter button. So if you're entering a pin, then it knows you know, how many digits you have on your pin and, and therefore does not uh, require an enter button. Now, that's an extreme case, but that's how we built it. In, in your scenarios, in your situations, you'll find several other ways how you can optimize either the user experience or the execution time or some other thing that's important for you, okay? But you only get to see it when you're playing with it. There's some stuff you cannot see if you're not playing with it, okay? That's why experiencing versus just the thinking, they're not the same thing. Okay, so uh, another important thing, not, not, not as fancy, but you got to have the necessary resources. Programmers, testers, project managers, subject experts, money, you know, real important, and the time to be able to do it. So uh, that's how, you know, good project management is done. So what do we do at Secure Me? Do we follow it? No. I'll be honest, no, we did not. Why? Because we're in a shoestring budget. When you pay out of your own pocket, you know, you're going to cut corners. And that's, that's exactly what I did. We, we skipped some early testing. It still worked because, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I can tell what's important, maybe what's not so important. But uh, if you have the ability, and especially in areas that you're not expert in, uh, don't, don't take the shortcuts. It'll come back to bite you. Okay, halfway through, uh, another important one is getting the buy-in from management, marketing, sales, developers. If you're in a small company, uh, that's fairly easy to do. On a large company, uh, or not all the, uh, all the leadership is maybe aligned. So you, you really need to get their buy-in. Uh, you know, as I said, in a startup, it could be a one or two person decision. It's pretty quick. Uh, we, we lived with our decisions. And, uh, and, and, you know, in some cases there were some surprises, but that was it. We were committed to it. And we didn't say, hey, why don't you tell me about it? No, we made a decision and we moved on, right? Uh, that's important. This becomes, an, if you don't deal with the issue of the buy-ins, as problems arise later on in the project, uh, somebody may come in, let's say from the business side or from the sales or marketing side, and says, hey, I never agreed to do to this date. Okay, I wanted it by that date. I, I'm not supporting you. Then, then, then you're in a, in, a, in a bind. What are you going to do? You have a date that you cannot support, right? Uh, so it's really important to make sure everybody says yes. Okay, seven is an extension of that. If they've said yes, I, you know, I, I will commit to that then you got to keep people accountable, okay? Now, this is a culture thing. It's not a book thing. It's not a report thing. You know, it's not an email thing. This is a culture thing. It really, really comes from the top. You have a project plan at SecureMe. We all lived with the project plan. Same thing with uh, Septium. We live with the, by the project plan, okay? Slippage is culturally unacceptable, okay? You cannot slip. Now, do things happen? Absolutely, okay? And, but when there's a deviation, we don't go say, hey, you idiot, or you didn't work, how did that happen? First, we have two, three-day projects, right, for each milestone, each, each little uh, to-do item. We know when there's a slip. And then we'll look and see, why did we get a slip? Well, we got a slip because 
you know, Google changed the API, now it's much more complex to integrate, and we had to provide something else that we didn't have to provide before, so it's taking more time. Okay, learning experience. Rule number three, deal with the unknowns. Risk management, we didn't do a good job there. Okay, you do enough projects using this and have the culture to be able to say, yes, slippage is not acceptable, we don't, we don't harp on our people, and, but we do want to know when something slips. So we do a better job of management. I always tell my team that there are only two reasons I would fire you for. And the most important is if you see something wrong and you don't tell me about it. But as a result of it, if you tell me something wrong, even if it's your fault, I'm not going to get mad at you. Just give me the opportunity to fix it before it becomes a big problem. Okay? And all of these is actually not just culture within the group, but, uh, uh, but ways of training and disciplining your group so that they become better in project delivery. Okay? So uh, it's, it's kind of important, and it's only from the top. Because if I'm hard on you for, for your project slippage, but I say, you know, Val, he's my old buddy. You know, we used to go to school together. I'm going to go easy on him. It doesn't work, right? You have to be. And then you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure you got the, you know, updated uh, this and that or the graphics or the images by that time. It says a project manager will be my responsibility to make sure that you get them on time. Because you don't get the, uh, the, the graphics on time, then you can't do your stuff. So yes, there's a slippage in your stuff, uh, it, it, but it's not your fault, right? Who's at fault? The project manager is at fault because they didn't make it happen, right? Or the graphics designer, whatever you're doing. So it's important not to, not to feel people chastised about that, not to make people bad, but just say, hey, you got to work. And then you got to stay an extra hour or two that day to finish it. Well, that's your responsibility. Or you're way ahead of your project and, you know, your brother is getting married, want to take the afternoon off. Okay, by me. You know, you're ahead of your uh, schedule. No problem. Now, feature creep. Anybody heard of feature creep? Okay. Anybody who hasn't heard of feature creep? Okay. We also call them chasing shiny objects. Why? Because we always get some ideas how to make things better, some new feature, or love it from the sales side, it comes in and says, oh, our competition is doing that. We got to add that feature. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to compete with them. We have to have it in. We have to have it in. We have to have it in. Okay? And uh, this is the number one cause for project delays. Number one reason for cost overruns. Okay? All, all that feature creep. So my, uh, uh, the, the way I typically deal with them is I kind of look at it and I say, you can't just say no, right? Because there's a business need. There's a business need. You can't say no. Maybe the landscape changed. Maybe you got to have that requirement added that you didn't know when you started the project. So uh, we look at it. If it's absolutely necessary, you put it in. If not, you try to delay to a version 1.1, 1.2, 2.0, 3.0, .0, .0, whenever, okay? So when is good software done? Anybody know the answer? When is good software finished? Never. Never. Right. That's, uh, that's what keeps us in business. But, uh, but seriously, there's always stuff that you can do better. And it's always good to see if it can be put, if it's not planned, if it could be put to a new version. So I'll put my entrepreneur hat on and see how we did it. Well, we did not do as good of a job. Because as we discovered things, as market changed, we have found in other ways of doing it. For example, originally we were doing with a QR code because I like QR logins. Uh, there's nothing to type. You notice nothing to type, no attack vectors, right? So software is much easier to support, much safer. But then we realized that you know, some of the older phones were not able to scan the QR code as easily. So we went a little extra step to make the QR codes very easy to use. Then I had that idea is, hey, why don't we just get your user ID and push a notification to your phone, and then you put your fingerprint on it, and you log in. That's not a bad idea, right? 
Well, actually, as I said, that's how I invented the uh, push uh, uh, notification verification process that's used by a lot of companies today, right? So we had that idea, and guess what? We took the time and paid for the cost uh, to build it. So uh, that's kind of how we dealt with it. That's, that's a really, really hard thing to do. You're, it's, it's always a balancing act, okay? But important thing to do, you go back to your cost estimates, you go back to your time estimates, and then you adjust them for the new reality. Okay, specs are not uh, just done once when you write them. Project plans are not finished when you start the project. Cost estimates are not final when you start the project. Okay, if you're making decisions that would adverse them, that, that would affect them adversely, or, or even positively, you make the adjustments, okay? And that's where the agility comes in. Okay, stress testing. Every software has an Achilles heel. Somewhere, it's not gonna work well. We had a client who had some existing software that came to us, and they said, well, it was working fine when we tested it, but we put it in the field, it's just those logins are taking forever. We don't know why. Can you help us with that? So we put our stress testing tool, and then, you know, one, two, three, and then 10, 100, 1,000. You know, it was just impossible for this thing to, to even, uh, you're, you're waiting as much as three, four minutes to be able to log into a system. It was crazy, okay? So we immediately realized with stress testing that there was a problem. And the, the old developer that they had who wrote it uh, just did something, it was using a global variable, so only one person could log in at a given time. And that was the problem. You wouldn't have known from regular testing of the code. And it was poorly planned, poorly designed, poorly executed, poorly architectured environment. But you will find those things sometimes. So the stress testing will show you some of the problems you have. So it's really important. Either you're going to know what they are, or your customers are going to tell you that you have a problem. But it's there. The earlier you know, the better it is. Uh, so what did we do at SecureMe? We didn't do stress testing uh, till we started selling. And the reason for that was uh, some of the tools uh, were very, very expensive. Nowadays, it's a little cheaper, but uh, stress testing can be very expensive. Uh, anywhere from, you know, it could be, uh, not now, but back then it would be somewhere between twenty to $100,000. And when you're a startup, that's, that's real money. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot more, there's services and a lot easier to, uh, ways to test. So uh, don't skip this test. We had enough experience to ballpark it and it worked for us. But unless you've had that seasoned experience about how systems perform at a certain way, uh, then you could get into trouble. So do your stress testing. Find out where your Achilles heel is. All right, it could be several areas, not just one. Okay, and this is my last point. Planning for success, okay? Success doesn't come just like that. You gotta plan for it. So uh, as you got, you're managing the development side, you're managing the business side, or you're interfacing with the business side, and, and really, you gotta make sure that what you, what, what you promise, you should be able to deliver. And maybe even just under-promise a little bit. I know it's cliche, but it works. And always try to deliver something more than what you promised. Why? It builds trust. You now become the trusted person, and then uh, you, you know, uh, uh, you, you're in their good guy list. And when, uh, when the shit hits the fan sometimes, then you really want those people backing you up. So, and, and one of the things I always try to do is plan a pleasant surprise at the end. I can't tell you how important that is, okay? And what I mean with the pleasant surprise is I had to finish it a little before than you said you're gonna finish it, uh, or uh, you know, finish on time, but you know that feature that you put to version 2.1? Well, deliver that within that time frame, okay? Something they didn't expect, or come under budget. So why most of the management side, business side of the house, uh, they remember how the project started 
it's kind of blurry how things went on throughout the project, but they always remember how the project ended. Okay, so if you end it with a pleasant surprise, you'll score yourself some brownie points. Uh, this is not as important as, you know, you're the entrepreneur, but you build uh, confidence with your team, you build brownie points with your investors, uh, you build brownie points with the rest of the management team, okay? Now, do we do that at Secure Me? No. Why would I not do that at Secure Me after saying, you know, how important that thing is? Well, I was the owner, I was the project manager, trying to surprise myself was kind of pointless, right? That wasn't gonna happen. But I, I, I try to do that on almost every project, if possible. Some projects you just can't, because you ran into some trouble and you're trying to wind out of that one. But uh, if you plan it early enough, uh, that's a pretty good brownie point, okay? All right, so you now know everything I know, or just about, okay? Do you have any questions? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. I think my biggest project failure was uh, my first CTO job uh, back in the uh, late 90s. Um, we were building the first uh, commercial insurance exchange on the internet. And if anybody was around back, back in those days, you just couldn't find technical people. And offshoring, uh, you know, almost 20 years ago, wasn't as easy as it was today. So you just couldn't find technical folks. So we had a really hard time hiring people at first. And I was approached by a company who said, look, we have this uh, 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 like a case tool, software engineering tool where you kind of specify, it spews out some Java code for you, and uh, you know, it'll do like most of the stuff you want to do. Okay, and then because it's Java, you can just modify it and uh, you can customize it any way you want. So I thought, hey, that's a pretty good deal. I'm a, bit, a bit little skeptic, but I had, the, I had the consulting firm come to my office, and in a half hour, they actually developed a real application. I was floored. I said, this is good stuff. I want to know more. But remember, I'm a skeptic, right? So I actually took their week-long development course, got some more details, everything looks good, and we're doing it. As it turned out, uh, even though it was supposed to do, uh, I'm sorry, I should have turned my phone off. So, um, even though it was supposed to do 80% of what we wanted to do, it only did 20% uh, of the time. So we, we spent 80% trying to get around the, the code and we ended up scrapping it and building it in .NET from ground up. So that was my biggest project failure. Yes. I'm sorry. I'll answer all the questions. So, the question is uh, regarding point seven, holding people accountable for yes. the projects. So I'm, I had a project that was um, we had a weekly call, status update, and all these things. Then we found a problem, and yeah. when we're trying to get down to it and want to make the person accountable, uh, he gave me the phone ultimatum. We can spend more time deep diving what happened. Or do you want me to slip the other milestones? You want me to what? Slip the other milestones. Uh huh. Okay. So, how do you, in your experience, hold people accountable? Okay. I see the problem. I recognize it. I know it's easy to fall into that situation. Uh, but in this case, I think there were things that could be done before you get to that point. Because after you have the car crash, it's too late, right? You got you to check left and right before you do the turn. So in this case, a couple of things would have helped. First, if you had uh, short deliverables, you know, a few days uh, per, per, uh, uh, per item, you'll know slippage a lot earlier. Two, uh, assuming there's no foul play, because I don't know if there is or not, because it happens, uh, assuming everybody had the good intentions and we're doing a good job, uh, what happened is your developer probably hit an unknown. Okay? So uh, it would have been the project management team's responsibility to list and deal with the unknowns ahead of time. Okay? So maybe it wasn't his fault he really dealt with it. 
So the third thing is, uh, do you really want me to find out what happened? Uh, or uh, that's going to slip the project schedule? Well, the interesting part is, he probably knows what happened. But he doesn't want to tell you. Okay, And uh, that's where my antennas go up. I've developed these antennas over the year. When I, when I hear some BS stuff, boom, they're up. Okay? Uh, and as I was hearing you, I was getting my antennas were going up again. So uh, that's fine. Uh, but you know, uh, this happens in environments where, uh, in, in punitive environments. And I don't mean you know, everybody gets uh, uh, scolded, but if developers don't feel comfortable that when they make mistakes, you know, if they come honestly, then you know, there'll be some stuff. They tend to do that. It's, it's protectionism. And we also have to understand that. Because I always look at my programmers as my children. So uh, I can't just you know, tell my son or daughter, OK, you screwed up. Uh, you know, I don't love you anymore. No, it's, we we're together in this thing, right? As long as you're honest and, and I'm honest and we're all doing our best, we just deal with it. Okay? So those are some of the factors. But you're telling me after the car crash, you really should be looking at it, what could have been done before the crash. Does that answer your question? Okay? Uh, kind of. But kind of. The, okay. At the end of the day, what I did for my program is basically I didn't want him on my team the next project. Okay. Because... Um, <sighs> Basically, what happened is he was trying to please his VP of engineering. I was the product line manager. And he's been saying on his dashboard, everything's green, when in reality, it was orange. Ah, OK. OK. So. Well, that's why I always tell you, what's one of my major rules for firing programmers? If you know something wrong and if you don't tell me, you rob me of the opportunity of trying to fix it before it becomes a big problem. And you're absolutely right. I wouldn't want that person on my team either. Yes. Question for you. Um, Can you speak up a little bit? Is this thing on? It's not on? Is that better? Yeah, yeah. Uh, question. And you, you know my background, you know, it's consumer products. But I'm oh, you're very good at it, and I know that. Too. Yes. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, that statistic that you threw up about the 71% failure rate and whatnot is actually relatively good to consumer products. Consumer products is 90%. And a failure? Lot of, yeah, failure rate. Oh, now, okay. A lot, of, a lot of that has to do with. Maybe you didn't do enough research. Maybe you didn't, you know, uh -huh. production test. Maybe your distribution situation changed from physical retail to online, and you didn't answer. Maybe it was competition. But one of the biggest things that is challenging product success or failure is the unrealistic expectations of C-suite mm -hmm. people that are basically saying, after, okay, after you've agreed to a 12 or 18 month planning timetable because of profit pressure, no, get it done in six months. And you make all this, and I was just wondering, in software with, you know, the multiples being incredible based mm -hmm. on sales and whatnot, is there, is there more pressure from C-suite on, you know, impacting that product success or failure because of their profit motives and whatever? Yes, so uh, there, you, you're, you're right. If it's not planned well, it happens. First rule of defense, or first line of defense, is getting the buy-ins. Remember, that's one of my points. We need to get the buy-in from the, from the C-suite, OK? And uh, if they're driving it, they need to agree to the time, the cost, the feature set. And once you have the buy-in, OK, they may come back saying, hey, for these reasons, we need to come to market faster. For these reasons, we need to add this feature set. For these reasons, we need to shrink the budget. But those are all new requirements, changes, and therefore you handle it as a change to the project, adjusting the timelines and the cost estimates, and getting rebuy-in for those as well. Okay? As long as there's an honest conversation, uh, that's fine. When it doesn't work is when there's an autocratic process. I, I said so, therefore you shall do. And people say, well, you're asking me to do the impossible. How can I do this? Look, I told you there are three buttons in project management. Uh, uh, t uh, so if, if, uh, if I don't have control in any one of the buttons, I can't, I can't make things happen. You basically tie my hand. You know, you tie one hand behind my back. I'm good. I'll, I'll, I'll steer. I'll manage. You tie both hands behind my back. I can't drive, right? So 
If that's a scenario, you got to avoid it. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, it was, this has been a great uh, presentation. So thank you for you know sharing all your You're experiences welcome. with us. So I, I found it really great, and I got a lot of great points from it. One of the things in your background, you in, you mentioned some really big inventions, mm -hmm. and that everybody uses. And you know, um, the question is, in your experience, what was the? Were you able to monetize it when you had the idea? <laughs> <laughs> and if, if you were the first to implement it, could uh -huh. you anticipate how big it would become and protect your intellectual property? Um, what was that experience? And if, you know, because I don't know what the answer is, the, the second part of that question is, what were the lessons and could you have, you know, in, in the process of coming up with an idea that you, you thought could be universal, um, would you do things differently? Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic question, and, uh, uh, and I, I really have to have an open kimono conversation for this, which I'm happy to do with you guys, okay? So uh, uninstall, um, I was at Symantec. Um, I thought it would be a really cool idea because I was in charge of uh, uh, Norton Desktop for Windows installation, and it was a very hairy product. Uh, don't tell Symantec folks, but uh, Norton Antivirus was a horrible, horrible product, which would uh, cause us to wipe our hard disk every three or four weeks, reinstall everything from scratch because it was very unreliable, very unstable. And, and I, I was in charge of installing the whole thing. It was so complicated, I wouldn't just be able to delete stuff. So I said, well, listen, I know the rules to install it, I bet I can come up with the rules to uninstall it, okay? So I went to the product management committee, and I said, well, I have this idea uninstalled that I'd like to build into the product, because if people didn't want some of the features, they, they don't get that whole bloat. So the, uh, the wise people at the uh, product management committee looked at me and they said, Jack, you know we're a software company, right? We want people to use our software and you want to give them a way to get rid of our software. Now, that's not really smart, is it? Just go do your job. I mean, true, true uh, story. So I went back. I don't know what happened in my childhood, but I'm tenacious. I don't give up easily, especially when I believe something. So I actually built it on my own time. I put it in there, and we didn't even have uninstall. It was install slash u for uninstall, OK? So shared it with some uh, other developers. They loved it. Just being able to get rid of uh, Norton Antivirus was a huge savings, uh, was a huge benefit for them. So, uh, and then I went back to the management committee. Look, I already did it. It's there. Uh, let's just put it in the documentation, OK? People love it. And they agreed to do it, and that's how uninstall was invented. Now, uh, fast forward uh, maybe a year or so, I'm no longer at Symantec. I should have taken that idea and just built an uninstaller for several products. Uh, I did not do that, but my tester did. And he was a multimillionaire at the age of 30, and I got bupkis, i.e. nothing. So, uh, so that's my first invention. I have the bragging rights. Uh, he has all the money. So uh, next time around, uh, I'm at uh, Quartrons, owned by Citibank at the time, now owned by Reuters. Uh, you know those uh, uh, stock market quotes, live quotes that all the stockbrokers used to have? That's the system. And uh, guess what? I'm again in charge of installation of the software, OK? Uh, part of her problem is, I, I mean, there are, I don't know, over 100,000 PCs, and these are pre-internet days, okay? Uh, basically, you know, Windows 3.1, 3.0 days. And so you're sending them a stack of floppies and for them to install, and I'm thinking, there's got to be a better way, there's got to be a better way. So we have this main server in Rochester, New York, that actually sends all the data feeds throughout the day. And each uh, uh, satellite office has a little server that, that gets those and then shares it to all the PCs. So I'm thinking, at nighttime, they're not doing anything. What if we just 
put a software, just, just an update on it, and then send it to all the PCs. And then when they're starting up, check to see if there's an update. If there is, we'll just install it, right? Good idea. Got the approval. Built it up. Uh, our test case was actually Microsoft Office that came in 33 floppies. Okay, you didn't even you know, distribute things on CDs in those days. And there was born the automatic software updates. And back in those days, you couldn't patent software. So both of those, I did not patent them. Though I did hear uh, Apple patented automatic software updates several years after I came up with. Uh, I don't know if they made any money. Now, the third one, look, I may be not so smart, but I'm not really stupid either. This time, I'm patenting stuff. So I actually own the patent on uh, push notification verification. So you, you brought up you brought up the the auto update. That's the one I'm really you know intrigued okay. about because this is the second time, right? And so when you're going through it, it's a pretty big idea. It's one of the reasons that like for for example like Google Chrome took mm -hmm. a huge browser um, market share because of the auto update feature, yeah. uh, which is kind of a you know a hidden transparent thing that people don't realize. Mm -hmm. So when you were developing the auto update, given your experience from before, and you're saying that you were you didn't have the ability to patent at that time, the idea, right. could you were you thinking at that moment, hey, you know, this is something, this is one of my big ideas that I should I, I should do something <laughs> with this intellectual property, whether it's patent or not. Okay. So your question you're asking me is, was I able to see what a big difference it would make in the computing world? to have such a capability? Well, the answer is, as a visionary, I always have big ideas. As a visionary, most of my ideas don't make it, OK? So I did not know how quickly or how important those two inventions were going to be, OK? I probably had another 20 inventions, 50 inventions maybe. They ne never went anywhere. Okay. So at the time, I didn't know that they were going to be so big. I just knew that it was good to have, it was important, and you know, people spoke, they liked it, they implemented it. Uh, as I said, back in those days, you couldn't patent software. It had to be hardware or some electronic device or something of that nature. Nowadays, you could. We actually have too many software patents, in my opinion. But, uh, but I patented uh, this, this third one. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, yes, I'm still waiting. Anybody who uninstalled uh, any software, just leave a quarter on the desk as you're leaving, OK? Yes. Yeah. Thank you again for a fantastic presentation. You're welcome. Uh, entire time listening and reflecting on the conversations I've been having with my CTO uh -huh. in light of we're looking to raise our next round, a lot of the tech talent that we're staring at, there's only a handful of folks that are actually local. Uh -huh. um, so a mix of offshore and mm -hmm. just remote around the US. What particular advice would you have for someone that's both looking to hire and looking to manage in an increasingly distributed context? Ah, uh, yes. By the way, thank you. I'm glad that you find uh, this, this presentation uh, useful. I've been working on it for 10 years. I told you I don't give up, uh, you know, constant refinement. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm very, very passionate about having companies build their own software. Because a good custom software is like a good custom suit. Nothing will make you feel look better or feel better. And that's how you distinguish yourself from, from the competition. And I really do believe that. So uh, uh, yeah, it, it's one of my passions to kind of help companies be successful at this process, because it's a difficult process. So regarding offshore and the talent shortage, uh, the talent shortage is true. Uh, it's definitely uh, a problem. And um, the other problem is the cost of the talent when you find it. Again, very expensive. So as, uh, uh, as entrepreneurs, as startups, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of choice but offshoring. Okay? Now, having done offshoring for, I don't know, 16, 17 years now, uh, it is not easy to develop offshoring. So let me ask you, how many people have had software offshoring experience? OK. Uh, just keep your hands up. How many of you were happy with the results of your offshoring experience? 
Uh, if you're not happy, take it down. So that's okay. You are happy. Excellent. How many of you ran into issues that were significant? Okay. It's actually not bad. I wish we had some more people. Then it would be more representative. Uh, most of the companies that I spoke to, just like the pens that went up today, offshoring is a problem. You really have to know how to manage offshoring. Uh, if you want to know more about it, uh, come see me afterwards. Uh, one of the things, uh, uh, because they're a vendor, uh, the good news is because they're a vendor, assuming a reputable vendor, they really have to know what they're doing to be able to stay in business, uh, you know, unless you're just shopping for the bottom price, and, and, and that's, that's a losing battle. You're basically paying less for a sunk cost. Okay, and that just doesn't make sense. So assuming they're good in what they're doing, so they bring in some talent and some processes, that's good, but you have to know how to manage them. It is not like managing the US teams. Communication is a big problem. Uh, culture is a big problem. Uh, I was dealing with an offshore developer one. We are talking about you know, loan payments and stuff. He didn't know what mortgages were, never heard of them before, okay? So they can't make the right decisions if they don't understand the concepts. Uh, not, I'm not finding any blame, but these things happen. Language barriers are big, okay? So communication has to be crystal clear. Uh, we, uh, when we, we, have, we have our own offshore team, and actually I train them. There's a culture process, uh, and, and uh, we talk to them every night. It's very laborious, but I haven't found a better way. Okay, but you can't get the end results. You got to have the good people. Uh, you are uh, very likely to get hit with, um, let's say, more green talent than you would with experienced talent. And their idea is they put like one senior person and a bunch of you know green green people, and uh, so so you get the end result and the cost benefits. In reality, it doesn't work so well. Uh, so I'd be a stickler for, uh, uh, you know, more experienced folks on the team, even if it costs a little bit more. And you got to stay on top of them. Everything's clearly documented. There's a certain language that we use to communicate. So if you want more, come and see me. But you have to do it. I agree. Yes? Okay. I'll, I'll still be here, by the way. So, uh, so you, I, I was looking through the list, and you mentioned... Um, several steps and then you say, you know, having some modules that you can push out and get some feedback on. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the two things, you know, I've always lived by is we, we had what we call triad, which is, which is pretty much a product manager, a designer, and a developer. And it, it could be like a lead developer, you know, mm -hmm. knowing there may be several developers on the project, but that, that triad or that aspect yeah. of doing things before you're actually implementing code yeah. is extremely important because what happens is the, even a developer can play a product management role in sure. certain cases if you have good developers, right? They're going to come in and go, hey, have you thought about this use case sure. or something else that actually, you know, I may not have thought of as a product right. person or whatever. Um, so it builds a better uh, product. And then the second piece that I think um, I would say doesn't happen enough is, is user testing early on. So if you're looking at, like, wireframing and prototypes, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of pretty much, you know, working with users and, that are going to be using the product and actually, you know, clicking through a high fidelity prototype yeah. that's, that's, you know, fake data and whatever else, but they right. can go through it. Beautiful. I mean, that solves a lot of the challenges of, of some of what you just That's actually here. part of lean entrepreneurship as well. That's where yeah. it kicks in. You don't have a product, but you can have, you know, a, an empty HTML application that just puts some dummy data and you, you click on a button, all it does, it takes you to the next screen. Yeah. No database, no, no stuff. So people get a feel. But that's market acceptance, which is a little different than... Uh, technical product development, but you're absolutely it right. Depends, As an yeah, entrepreneur, we have to we have right. to do I mean, both. I've done a lot in the fintech space, the back end payment stuff. Sometimes yeah. your, your lead time's a lot longer. Oh really? Yeah. Well, come and talk to me. We did uh, we did online payment processing for Western Dental. Processed about two hundred fifty million dollars a year. We have uh, a lot of interesting stories to trade. I bet. Yes. Okay. If there's anybody else who wants uh, who wants to talk to me, I'll be here for a while. Thank you so much, Jack. We Thank you. you. One question, did you find it useful? Was that beneficial? Was it worthwhile your time? Okay, good, thank you.